Good evening, and welcome to a very special Virtual Traditions of the Season at the Paul Revere House. My name is Meg Mays, and I'm the Regent of the Paul Revere Chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution, right here in Boston, Massachusetts. And it is my chapter's distinct privilege and pleasure to have been partnering with the Paul Revere Memorial Association and the Paul Revere House for over 125 years. Tonight, we are going to be hearing from a few people from DAR, but most importantly from the staff of the Paul Revere House to take us on a quick little walk through the house so we can learn how the Revere's would have spent this time of the year. First, we'd like to start off with a little Christmas message from the President General of the Daughters of the American Revolution, Mrs. Denise Doring Van Buren. Happy holidays. On behalf of the National Society of the Daughters of the American Revolution, I would like to extend not only my holiday greetings, but also my appreciation to the Paul Revere side for maintaining this important piece of American history. I'm so very proud of the fact that DAR was involved in the rescue of the Paul Revere House, and I know that our local chapter members are privileged to be able to support its continuing mission to tell this important story of American history. As we approach the 250th anniversary of the American Revolution, it's critically important that we raise awareness amongst our fellow citizens of the importance of stories like that of Paul Revere. The stories of courage, of sacrifice, of braveness, of people who are willing to risk all in order to found these United States of America. I applaud your work. I thank you for your continued commitment to ensuring that Future generations will appreciate the ride of Paul Revere and the story of his contributions to the American Revolution. You know, these stories are only one generation away from extinction. It's important that we maintain them, that we pass them on. It was important to our founders of the DAR in 1890, and it's important to us today. So a simple thank you for what you do and very best wishes for continued success in 2021 and beyond. Thank you, Mrs. Van Buren. And now, the state regent of the state of Massachusetts DAR, Paula pratt Rankis, on her thoughts on the Paul Revere House, as well as a little, few of her Christmas memories. Hello everyone, I am Paula Rankis, state regent of the Massachusetts Daughters of the American Revolution. This past March 2020, I had the occasion to visit the Paul Revere House with many daughters from across our nation as we commemorated the 250th anniversary of the Boston Massacre. I was feeling so much pride being in the house, sharing with the daughters the deep historic role Boston and Massachusetts area patriots played in the birth of our nation. As we have begun the holiday season, I'm recalling some of my family's traditions. The get-togethers, especially with my mom's family, which is Italian and a large one. My mom loved to bake, and a large part of the season was baking many cookies pies and breads. We would have containers of cookies to draw from into January. So for those that know me, you know where I received my baking jeans. I'm wishing you a very happy holiday season and that you and your family stay well. Thank you for your donations for this very important part of our history, the Paul Revere House. And now on with the show. I'm pleased to introduce Mina Zaneri who is the executive director of the Paul Revere Memorial Association and the Paul Revere House to start off this really exciting evening. Nina, take it away. Thanks, Meg. Hi, and welcome to the program tonight. I'm Nina Zanera, the executive director of the Paul Revere Memorial Association. And before we start the program, I wanna do a couple thank yous. First of all, thank you to the Massachusetts Society of Cincinnati for supporting the musical portion of tonight's event. And then, of course, there's the Paul Revere chapter of the DAR, our longtime partners and friends. In fact, the DAR really has been connected to the Revere House before the association was even started. In 1895, they marked the house with a wonderful plaque that really clearly showed that it was Paul Revere's house, and that was an important part in the process that led to the ultimate restoration. So thank you, Paul Revere chapter. You really have been our friends for a wonderfully long time. Now it's my great honor and pleasure to invite you into the Revere House, where you'll learn perhaps some surprising facts about the way families in the 18th century New England, like the Revere's, approached the holiday season.
everyone. Welcome into the house. We are so happy to welcome you into the Revere house and the best chamber as the Revere family would have referred to it as. Uh, my name is Robert Chimp. I am the research and adult programming director here for the Paul Revere Memorial Association. And I know several of you, if not many of you, have had the chance to visit the house before. So you might recognize this room as the first one that you see when you come up the stairs onto the second level of the home. As the best chamber to the house, it was indeed a chamber for the Revere's. They used it as the primary sleeping quarters for the house over the 30 year stretch that they owned the home from 1770 to 1800. But they use the word best also in the sense that this is really the room and the space where they would have centralized a lot of the nicer furniture, decor, things that they owned because they did use it for entertaining purposes as well. So somewhat differently than we think about a lot of room usage today in uh, our modern times is most rooms mean single use, especially bedrooms, but for the Revere's, every room is multifunctional, and we really see that here in this space today. And in that sense, they definitely would have used it for small parties, small entertaining purposes, and that's what we're seeing here is we're thinking about the Revere's and the holiday season. Now, when thinking about the holiday season for the Revere's, not a lot of Christmas connections actually for them. Or if it was a Christmas celebration, would have been very modest in size. For the Revere's, and certainly for the Howards, the first owners of the Revere House going back to 1681, Christmas would not have been the major celebration in this holiday season. Especially for the Howards, as they were still Puritans religiously, there was no real biblical connection to Christmas, especially a Christmas celebrated in December. Um, so that would not have been the primary holiday whatsoever. Uh, for the Puritans, without this biblical connection, um, there was no primary focus on Christmas being the holiday. And in fact, in the 17th century, for a period of time, uh, Christmas and celebrating Christmas uh, in Massachusetts Bay Colony actually was illegal. Uh, now, by the time of the Revere's, those strictures had certainly been loosened. It was no longer illegal, but kind of the, the lingering Puritan connections for the Revere's congregational church connections uh, was still fairly strong. So Christmas would not have been the primary holiday. By the 1790s, though, which is when this room is set to, those were being loosened, so perhaps the Revere's might have, as they would have called it, kept Christmas, which would have been a very modest uh, observance, perhaps they could have attended an Anglican service here um, in the North End or in Boston. We don't have any documented evidence that they did, but it's certainly a possibility if you're thinking about Christmas specifically. Now, beyond Christmas, uh, the other major holidays that would have been celebrated uh, for the Revere's certainly would have been Days of Thanksgiving and New Year's. Now, Days of Thanksgiving really could have been any day and could have been celebrated at different levels. So it could have been a personal day of Thanksgiving for the Revere family, could have been a colony or statewide day of Thanksgiving, or could have been a national day of Thanksgiving if we're thinking into the early United States of America. Now, these could have fallen on any number of occasions, perhaps uh, the health of a previously sick child, uh, perhaps a good harvest coming in for the year, or maybe even um, something bigger like a victory in a war or some sort of military conflict. Um, now, again, these days could have been celebrated both personally or in a larger community sense, but for the Revere's, they definitely would have celebrated them and most likely would have done it in small numbers here in this space. And you'll hear about some of the types of things that it would have done or would have made more specifically for Days of Thanksgiving uh, from Emily Holmes, our education director, in uh, just a few minutes along the program. But actually, some of the things that they would have eaten and made for those occasions are not too different than what you probably have on a traditional Thanksgiving yourself. Now, the other thing that the Revere's would have celebrated would have been actually the New Year's. Um, so, and we have that set up here in, um, in the room at the moment. Uh, now, it would have been modest celebrations, again, for the Revere family and for Bostonians around the New Year's. But on those occasions, they might have had a couple of friends over, perhaps uh, relatives, maybe some of Paul's siblings, maybe the Hitchborns just across the way, if you've been on our location here, where our offices primarily are in the Hitchborn house. Um, and they might have even exchanged some gifts on this uh, celebration around the New Year. So somewhat similar to what we think about uh, Christmas today for gift exchanges, they might have done that at New Year's. And in smaller measures for sure, but perhaps they could have exchanged rings, fruits, uh, almanacs, books of different sorts. We do know that Paul Revere certainly was uh, an avid reader, so he might uh, imagine Paul receiving a book or even giving a book 
away here in this room somewhere in the 1790s. Um, and we see this celebration here um, with a few um, kind of modest treats and, and sweets that they definitely would have had at the time. You might have seen things in the room like uh, a fruit display, perhaps even a pineapple. Rented pineapples weren't uh, out of the question actually in Boston at the time, as it definitely was a status symbol, a sign of affluence. So I think we could imagine perhaps a pineapple in this space. You might have some other treats. We have some drinks, some dessert syllabubs here on the table, perhaps some cookies, tarts, and again, various fruits of different sorts here in this space. Now, it certainly would have taken a lot of work to put together the various meals, the various treats that they would have had here in that space. So with that in mind, I'm going to toss it down to Emily Holmes, our education director in the kitchen. It's going to tell you a little bit more about that process for the Revere's. Welcome to Rachel's Modern Kitchen. We're standing in the kitchen of the Paul Revere house. Paul and his family bought this house in 1770 when it was already 90 years old. And when it was built in 1680, this house had a kitchen put down in the basement level below this floor. So when Paul moved in with his first wife, Sarah, that's where she would have been cooking down in the basement level. And unfortunately, Sarah passed away about three years after they bought this house in 1773. Paul remarried later that year, and Rachel Walker, his second wife, is the one who would have been cooking down in that basement kitchen. But the Revere's did what a lot of people do when they buy an old house still today. They remodeled eventually when they could afford to, when they had enough money. So this space that we're standing in was converted into a kitchen. It was here before, and they added a fireplace to it by adding this whole new chimney. They put a new fireplace in this space that had not had a fireplace in it before and they put in a modern appliance, essentially. This is a modern kitchen fireplace for around 1790. And there's a couple things that make this fireplace better than the one downstairs. One of those is this brick oven over here, which is at the front rather than tucked way in the back like it is down in the basement. The opening of the fireplace itself is also a lot shallower and more angled, which gives Rachel less room to work on, but it's really a benefit because it gives much more heat and is much more efficient at cooking the food here in front of the fire. So this room that we're in also has a couple other benefits to it. It's also a space that's much closer to the backyard essentials. So outside these walls behind us, the Revere's would have had their cow shed for cow and chickens. They would have had their kitchen garden for growing all those herbs and spices that Rachel could be using in her cooking and medicines from this room in the kitchen. It also, of course, had the well and the firewood storage. And that's really essential for bringing those items into the kitchen space, right? You want to be close to the well and close to the firewood because those things have to come in and out of this room all the time, all day long. So this oven that we're looking at here is where Rachel would do a lot of those baking projects. And you all have received access to those recipes that we sent as part of this event. So hopefully you'll try them if you haven't yet. They're adapted to modern kitchen cooking techniques. But this is the space where we can imagine Rachel making some of those real recipes. So perhaps baking seed cakes in this oven, making a cider cake here in the oven. And she would know how to do that because she had years and years of experience. So it took a long time to learn how to bake in a brick oven like this. You have to light a fire in that space. You have to wait for about two hours for the bricks to heat up inside, and then scoop out all those coals with these long shovels we have leaning up against the wall. So you scoop out the coals, and then you use a broom to brush out all the ashes, and then you're ready to put your food in there to bake. So that process takes about two hours of preparation. And Rachel, with her years of experience, could know from just sticking her arm in there and feeling how hot it was, whether it was ready or not. She didn't want to burn those seed cakes, she wanted to make sure the temperature was nice and slow and ready for baking those things that are basically cookies. So Rachel would pass on that knowledge, right? This is the space where she was teaching the girls in the family how to do those same skills, how to cook on a fireplace like this. So when she first moved here in 1773, this is where um, Paul's family was living. And he had had eight children with Sarah. Unfortunately, two had died young. There were six surviving children when he married Rachel, and five of them were girls. So they were ranging in age between two and 15 at that point. And Rachel was the one who would have carried on teaching them all those skills they needed to know how to uh, work in a space like this and how to run a household like this. She went on to have eight of her own children. And out of those five who survived, two were daughters. 
And they were young in the 1790s in the time period that we're showing in here. They were still young girls in this household in that time. By that point in the family, though, Paul's older kids were already married and having children, and there were grandchildren here. So Rachel was likely teaching some of those grandchildren as well, especially at the holiday time, right? This is when people are coming home to visit. Even if they don't live very far away, they're still coming home for Thanksgiving to their parents' houses. So we can imagine that Rachel would be hosting many holiday gatherings here and preparing many of those holiday meals right in this room. So the big holiday for the Revere family was likely Thanksgiving, and that's one of the big ones people come home for. So imagine what would have to go into the preparations here. A, ma a, a major Thanksgiving meal for the family at the Revere's would include turkey, for sure, sometimes a goose, maybe instead of turkey, but usually turkey, definitely, and maybe also a goose, and at least two chickens roasted, and at least two other chickens baked into pies. So Rachel would be roasting those fowls here in this fireplace using the rotisserie oven, which we have here in front of the fire. It's painted black now, but it would have been uh, shiny at that time and would reflect the heat from the fire as you were turning the handle of the spit over here on the side gradually. So that's a, a pretty modern invention for the 1790s. And if you couldn't afford this, or if you were cooking a, a turkey before this time, before these were available widely, you had a different technique you could use. You could also tie a string to a hook at the top of your fireplace, and then tie the other end to the feet of that bird, and spin it around, and let it unwind, and then spin it again, and let it unwind, and that would also roast. So you have a couple options for how to roast a big fowl or a small fowl here on a fireplace like this. So the, the, the meat is the main course, but of course they're also serving vegetables, they're serving breads, baked in an oven like this, they're also serving preserves, so things that they had uh, preserved earlier in the year when they were available, and pickles, of course, lots of pickles in that time period. That's the main course, but the other important part of Thanksgiving is, of course, the pies, and the pies were just as important as the turkey back then. So a family like the Revere's might have 10 apple pies and 10 pumpkin pies. That's pretty average for this time period for one dinner like this. So they could have other pies too, things like mince and cranberry and squash, um, plum could be made into pies, not as important as the apple and pumpkin. And the other really key pie that we aren't probably as familiar with today is Marlboro pie. So Marlboro pie is a very common in the 17th, 18th century New England area, and it was made with apples and lemons and it's a custard pie, so it doesn't have a, a top crust. So this is the kind of pie that you could have any time of year, but you had to have it at Thanksgiving. That was like a key essential ingredient to everybody's Thanksgiving. And it's also the sort of um, dish that people felt like their grandmother had the best recipe for a Marlboro pie. That was something people were very proprietary about. So we can imagine lots of pies being made here in the week leading up to Thanksgiving when Rachel would be at the pie board, is what they would call it in that time, for days in advance preparing these pies. And then they'd have to store them somewhere. So they might be storing them in a cool space, maybe down in the basement level where that kitchen used to be, maybe upstairs in an unheated bedroom, maybe in a cabinet or a, a pie closet, they sometimes call them. So lots of preparations for that big meal held on uh, an afternoon dinner situation in a house like this. Now, Thanksgiving is a really, really key holiday for the Revere's. As you've heard from Robert, Christmas was not as big a deal here, so we can imagine Rachel and her daughters here in this space doing chores like on a normal day, on a Christmas day. Paul would probably go to work, they would do their normal whatever routine day chores they had that day, so Mondays would be wash day, Tuesdays would be ironing day, those chores would be happening in here in the ugh, winter season for sure. So just kind of a normal routine. But there were lots of other things that could be celebrated in this December season, especially for the Revere's who had birthdays at this time of year. So we don't know how they celebrated their birthdays, but Paul and Rachel were both born in late December, Paul on the 21st and Rachel on the 27th. So those are certainly things that might get um, a party here. And of course, New Year's Day is a big deal. So New Year's Day, another occasion where people might be visiting here or they might be going visiting, but we can really imagine Rachel baking up some of those treats, some of those seed cakes or shortbreads here in the oven for a card party that night. We don't really have many um, utilitarian pieces that the Revere's used in their household. We have some other furniture that belonged to them, but there's one key piece in this room that we do have that is from the Revere family, and that is a little bronze pause net. It's a little pot down here next to the 
rotisserie oven. It has three little legs and a little handle. And that is a kind of pot that Rachel could use to make candies and sauces. And it is the sort of thing that um, would be really useful for um, making treats that are delicate, that need really careful, slow heat that you can control easily. You put the hot coals underneath it, and that's why it has those legs, and that lets you control the temperature better. So really delicate things could be made in there. Maybe special drinks. You might have seen the syllabubs upstairs in the best chamber. Those would be mixed up in this kind of pot. Uh, maybe a jelly, uh, a currant jelly, or a mold wine. One of my favorite holiday treats is mold cider. And one of our staff people, Alex, is gonna tell you more about how to make mold cider today and how Rachel would have sourced those ingredients from her own historic home. So you're gonna hear from Alex in a bit, but we wanna thank you all for visiting us here at the Paul Revere House for the holidays. I'm lucky enough to live in a house built in 1804 in Hingham, Massachusetts, and this is the original hearth. You can see the bread oven here, the original fireplace crane here. I want you to imagine that the following cooking demonstration is actually taking place in a giant pot over the hot embers of the fire. Instead, let's head over to my significantly less exciting 21st century kitchen to see what I've got on the stove. I wish you could smell this. I've got some hot mulled cider going on the stove and the aroma that it's filled the house with has instantly conjured up feelings of celebration, festivity, tradition, and there's a reason for that. There's a century lo centuries long association between hot mulled drinks and winter celebration. Mulling itself is a celebratory act. Spices, once they've made their way all the way down the Silk Road from the Far East and into Western cuisine have been expensive. and Using them is a special occasion ingredient, really. In the 18th century, spices like cinnamon and cloves were actually thought to warm the body up. Their spicy nature were considered to have health benefits. These tasted drinks were all often called winter warmers and could include rum, water, spices, sometimes even butter. You all have the recipe for the mold cider that I'm using here, but interesting enough, cookbooks were actually pretty rare in the 18th century. Most young women learned cooking from female relatives, mothers, aunts, sisters, and most traditional food didn't require a lot of careful measuring or flavoring. Things like boiled or baked meats, beans, pies, breads, puddings, uh, those were pretty straightforward. Still, 
Some good cooks were asked to write their methods down. Often though, these recipes were pretty hard to follow if you were an inexperienced cook because they called for a handful of this or a mite of that. Lucky for us, mulled cider is pretty hard to mess up. We start with our core ingredient, the apple. So long associated with New England, I think some might not realize that apples are actually not indigenous to the New World. Apple seeds, along with those of other fruits and vegetables, arrived on the first ships of European settlers. The first apple orchard in Massachusetts was planted by William Blackston in 1625. He was the first European settler to the Boston area, actually living there before a Massachusetts Bay Colony was even an organized settlement. And it was pretty quickly generally acknowledged that apples grew better here than they did in England. And thus began the centuries long association of apples with New England. Uh, apples are easier to grow than barley. So cider actually replaced beer drinking pretty quickly. And orchards can also be used to claim marginal land, flourishing in places where nothing else grows. Amelia Simmons recommended in 1796 that apples are highly useful in families. There's not a single family, but might set a tree in some otherwise useless spot. I'd like to share a few of my favorite 17th and 18th century New England apple names. Winter banana, juicy bite, autumn strawberry, bushwhacker, bullet, sops of wine, and cabbage head. So having procured cider from the market, not having a cider press at home, hers was probably alcoholic, though I'm using non-alcoholic cider from Carlson Orchards in Harvard, Massachusetts. Rachel Revere would now have to think about flavoring it. The first bit of luxury Rachel would add to this cider is a bit of citrus. The sour note gives a nice accompaniment to the sweet nature of the apples. The availability of citrus fruits in 18th century Boston firmly places the great port within the triangular trade. Fruits like lemons, oranges, and pineapples would have arrived in ships carrying sugar and other tropical exports, all cultivated using slave labor in the Caribbean. Next was spices. Spices, though expensive, would have been present in most colonial American homes. Although the average person was probably aware that spices came from faraway places, they were also such a long entrenched part of our inherited English culinary tradition that they probably would have seemed somehow both exotic and mundane. The colonies were firmly enmeshed in global trade networks and any commodity available to the English consumer was also available to their colonial counterparts. The discovery of the new world also disrupted traditional spice trading routes that had been in place since the Middle Ages. Some spices that had previously only come via the Silk Road in Far East were now being cultivated in the West Indies. Indeed, all spice is indigenous to the Western Hemisphere, having been discovered by Columbus in present-day Jamaica. So say Rachel needs to replenish the spice box that she keeps next to her kettle in the kitchen, she could do this with a visit to a local grocer. In 18th century America, a grocer was a merchant who traded not only in spices, but in all sorts of imported goods. In fact, the word grocery or groceries was widely used at the time to mean any kind of imported good. Rachel might have found this grocer through an advertisement in a newspaper. The Boston Newsletter of December 1732, so a bit before Rachel's time, gives us an idea of how grocers functioned in 18th century Boston. It reads, grocer, John Merritt at the three sugar loaves and canister near the townhouse. Sugar loaves were a common and easily recognizable symbol for a grocer. Canisters, a generic term for something that we might call a box, it would hold tea, snuff, or coffee, all things that could be purchased at the grocer's, were also traditional things to have on your shop sign. The sign hanging above his door might have looked something like this. Merritt places his location at King Street, our modern day State Street, renamed after the revolution for obvious reasons, near the townhouse, which is the building that previously stood roughly where the old state house is today. Merritt also uses his advertisement to list all the things you can find in his shop. So his customer could purchase her cinnamon, allspice and cloves, as well as hair powder, castile soap, beeswax, saltpeter, brimstone and snuff. Though those last three things were probably purchased by a male member of the household. 
We know that at the grocers, her shopping experience was already being influenced by what we might, we might today call consumerism. Uh, care was taken to promote the provenance of certain things, note the Castile soap, and therefore to increase its value. Other examples are English pickled walnuts, Florence oil, Dutch pipes, and turkey figs. And items were carefully merchandised and displayed to really maximize their marketability. So we've assembled all of our ingredients. The cinnamon and cloves can go in whole. The allspice that you see in the middle there, she might have used her mortar and pestle to grind that into a powder. Our citrus can be sliced in pretty little discs. And after mulling for a few hours or all day, it's ready to drink. We hope you've enjoyed this little holiday treat this evening. If you've enjoyed your time, please consider becoming a member of the Paul Revere House. Memberships start at just $20, and the link is available on the website. From all of us at the Paul Revere Chapter, and on behalf of the Paul Revere Memorial Association and the Paul Revere House staff, we all wish you a happy and healthy holiday season with you and yours.